Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lewis and Clark, an introduction to the core of discovery. My name is Dr. Rick Cromey. I'm a historian, a speaker, a writer. I work for American Cruise Lines as their Lewis and Clark historian. And, and I want to take you in the next several sessions on the journey, telling their story and hopefully inspiring you to want to know just a little bit more about uh, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, as well as Chicago Wea and York and Patrick Gass and John Ordway and many of the others that were part of this incredible uh, journey to the Pacific Ocean. So why do we study history? History is important. And we need to, um, to recognize that if we don't study it, and we don't look at the, we don't get the actual facts that we can have some things happen. I like what Clinton Snowden had to say about this in, eight, in 1909. 1909, he wrote these words, quote, the perversions of the story have already intruded themselves into our literature and even found a place in our school books from which they cannot be too quickly eradicated. If you're listening closely, what he's basically saying is that if we're not careful, more of us will believe the spin, the false narratives, the, and most of these falsehoods are basically innocent spins, if you will. They're just ways to elaborate the story. And one of the advantages that we have with the Lewis and Clark story are the journals. I mean, the journals are very helpful to uh, understanding what really went on. They, um, the journals, we have uh, five existing journals that have survived. Uh, the Lewis and Clark's journal obviously survived. Uh, a man by the name of Joseph Whitehouse, uh, Patrick Gass, and John Ordway, they all survived. We also have uh, part of a journal from um, Charles Floyd, who uh, passed away on the trail. Uh, he didn't get very far, but he did write and contribute. Uh, the other journals are um, are lost. We have no idea what happened to them. They just they they disappeared. Uh, some of them got destroyed in in some accidents that happened and and such. But what's nice about having multiple journals is that you can lay them down on each day and you can take a look at um, at the facts. And what's interesting is they don't even agree with them tell themselves many times. Uh, for me, as I was going through, I always took the captain's word over the over the um, sergeant's word or over the private's word if there was a private that was talking. Um, you know, and the reason for that is I felt like the, the the captains really had a good handle on the numbers. You know, if Clark says he sent out five people that day to go hunting and Patrick Gass comes along and says he, he sent out three people, I'm going to take captain over uh, Sergeant Gass in this matter. And, and that's because the captains have to be aware of all these individuals, how they're moving and stuff. And I think that they would have kept a little bit better records of that, whereas you know, the sergeants were awful, often working off of memory uh, about their days. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here with this story is that we do have a lot of, uh, you know, these multiple records help us to, to verify exactly what's going on. The, um, the names, uh, the, 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 the events, uh, the, the different uh, movements that are going on. And there have been a lot of um, changes, uh, a lot of narratives that have been spun uh, since um, since the Lewis and Clark journey that uh, give historians really uh, something to think about. And I think that's probably the key. They do give us something to think about. But the reality is what is what is true. So for me, I'm going to rely primarily upon the journals. Uh, there may be a couple times where I refer to, to Indian uh, um, you know, uh, tradition or uh, oral tradition in their case, uh, but for the most part, what I'm going to do is stick right to the journals, you know, just tell you what's and, and the letters that were written, the things that we can verify, the facts that are there and um, encourage you just to come along and, and take a look. Now, to get us started here, uh, I want to allow Dayton Duncan. Uh, he's a he's a Lewis and Clark historian, uh, someone who's written um, quite a bit about Lewis and Clark. And I like what he has to say about why we need to look at the Lewis and Clark story, why it's so important. He writes this. He says, quote, it's America's story. Uh, they turned the nation and faced the nation to the West. And that's where the future had always been. 
That's where hope and possibility have been. And I think that's what draws us to Lewis and Clark, says Dayton Duncan, and I agree. He continues, it's about possibilities. It's about what could be, sometimes what is, and sometimes what isn't. It's about potential and future and hope. So with that in mind, let's get right on the trail. Let's see what's going on. And we're Confidential. Gentlemen of the Senate and of the House of Representatives. The River Missouri and the Indians inhabiting it are not as well known as is desirable. An intelligent officer with 10 or 12 chosen men might explore the whole line even to the Western Ocean. The appropriation of $2,500 would cover the undertaking. Thomas Jefferson. In 1801, when Thomas Jefferson became president, Two out of every three Americans lived within 50 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. Only four roads crossed the Allegheny Mountains. The United States ended at the Mississippi River. Jefferson had always been curious about the West. His personal library at Monticello contained more books about the region than any other library in the world. But his books told him of a west where woolly mammoths still roamed, of erupting volcanoes, hills of pure salt, and blue-eyed Indians who spoke Welsh. Jefferson's books also described a northwest passage, an easy water route somewhere far beyond the Mississippi that would link the Atlantic with the Pacific make possible direct trade with all the Orient, and unlock the wealth of North America. Since the time of Columbus, the Spanish, French, and British had been searching for it. Whichever nation discovered the passage and controlled it, Jefferson was certain, would control the destiny of the continent. And we're going to start with a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to Congress back on January 18th of 1803. Now, for the record, uh, Thomas Jefferson had been looking at going west for a long time. Uh, he had even tried a few times just to get something marshaled and, and sent out west, but it just kind of kept falling apart. In fact, one of Clark's relatives was, was tapped for this work. His brother, his older brother, I believe, George, was tapped uh, to, uh, to go and... Uh, do this uh, work, but it, it just fell through. And there comes this point where, you know, kind of the, the, the stars all align, you might say, and they were able to bring uh, this opportunity together and make it happen. And that was um, largely because there was this big piece of land we're going to talk about mo momentarily called the Louisiana Purchase. And we were in negotiations with France to purchase this big chunk of property in the middle of our country at that point. Thomas Jefferson wrote this private letter, and I say private, really more of a confidential letter to Congress on January 18th, 1803. Now, I got to tell you, I, I can't imagine how any letter can be confidential uh, to Congress, you know, when we think about our Congress today. But back then, obviously, obviously they could keep a secret. Uh, but Thomas Jefferson writes these words. He says, quote, our nation seems to owe to its own interest to explore the Missouri River, uh, this only line of easy communication across the continent, that it should incidentally advance the geographical knowledge of our own continent cannot be but an additional gratification. E essentially, what Jefferson is saying here is that, you know what, we owe it to ourselves if we buy this property and we don't have it yet, we're just talking about it to uh, get out there, see what's, we'll see what it's all about. I, I think Jefferson was concerned that we, that if we bought something or purchased something and it was kind of just, it was close, but it was a long ways away at this point of having the actual purchase that, um, that we wouldn't be ready for it. And he wanted somebody absolutely ready for it. He wanted to have somebody trained, the right person trained and everybody was in their place ready to go so that all he had to do was push the button and they were gone. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and in fact, Congress is going to um, come back and 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 give the core discovery, uh, as they're going to become known as, 
a, bud, a budget of about $2,500. <laughs> now, that is almost laughable when you think about it. Uh, also, what's laughable is this statement by Thomas Jefferson when he proposes this uh, discovery, when he proposes this expedition, he says, quote, an intelligent officer with 10 or 12 chosen men fit for the enterprise and willing to undertake it might explore the whole line even to the Western Ocean. Now, he's going to undershoot that by about a third. I mean, he's going to, it's, it's going to be a, a much larger group of men that are going to be needed. In fact, when they left St. Louis um, officially in the spring of, of 1805 or four, excuse me, uh, they left with about with 43 men. So it was, it was almost four times as much uh, as many men were needed, but I love this little budget, 2,500 bucks. You know, what's that going to buy you in, the, in this, in this particular story? And in the end, it's not going to be a lot. Now let's let's take a look at the map. This is this is what the map looked like in their day. Um, and as you can see, the the United States, as it was called, really, then that's that area in pink. Uh, that was um, that was pretty much the eastern seaboard area, and the, the what, what at that point would be called uh, uh, the western edge would be you know Illinois and Wisconsin and, and those areas. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase is going to basically be that land that's west of the Mississippi, all the way to the Colorado Rockies, and even extend up into a bit of, of Canada a, a, at that time. And you see that in purple. Now, you notice that the, the yellow there, that's Spanish territory. Florida was still Spanish territory. The Southwest was still Spanish territory. Uh, Texas, obviously, uh, Utah, Nevada, California, all that was, was Spanish territory. Now, when you go up into the Northwest there, you see that gray area. And basically that means nobody had a real firm claim on it. Part of the reason for that was it was just so far away. In order to get to it, you had to go all the way around the Cape of, of South America and you had to come back up and it was just too far uh, to, to get. get to. And so you had French up there, you had the British up there, and you also had some American influence up there. In 1792, there was a man by the name of Robert Gray and he explored the Columbia. Uh, in fact, that's uh, how we get the word Columbia. And he named that river after his ship. Uh, but that, that's in that's in 1792. So we've already had some Americans up there. In fact, Oregon at that point was kind of looked at as being American land. Uh, but the British owned Washington. Uh, it was it was their territory. What Jefferson wanted was for an exploration of that purple area. Uh, but what he was really wanting to do was to take that Missouri River, take it all the way to its headwaters, see where it went, because nobody had a, a firm idea of that. They just had speculation. And then um, they knew that the Columbia River uh, was was going in towards the east. And the idea was was that there was there was a meeting spot place there for for these rivers to meet. They didn't know what that looked like. And in the end, they're going to be way off as far as their assumptions on this particular thing. It was about trade. Let's uh, begin our story by looking at uh, Meriwether Lewis. And I'm not going to give a complete biographical uh, background here. Uh, that's something for you to study if you're interested in it. But, but he uh, was born August 18th of 1774, grew up near Monticello, which is where Jefferson uh, was living. Uh, in fact, Jefferson was about uh, 30 years older than Meriwether Lewis. And, and so that was kind of a father son relationship The the Jeffersons knew the Lewis family, the Lewis family was not a insignificant family. Uh, in that part of Virginia, uh, they were fairly rich, uh, they had uh, a lot of influence. Uh, uh, they were well known. Uh, Lewis himself, uh, according to biographers was well educated. He was blonde. They said he had sunny hair, although he was a bit bow-legged, uh, according to his biographer. He was an outdoorsman and a hunter. And uh, during the Whiskey Rebellion, he actually went out into Pennsylvania, that er that neck of the woods, and and fought in the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, basically Western Pennsylvania. And he was an, he was a captain. Thomas Jefferson was looking for someone special. He's going to actually make um, going to make Meriwether Lewis his secretary. Meriwether Lewis was young. And uh, he had a bit of a reputation, uh, and there were some people that uh, thought he was maybe too young. Uh, there were people who didn't think he was ready uh, for for a, a, an expedition of this sort. They thought he needed a little bit more maturity. There were some that were concerned about his uh, 
uh, his moods and his dispositions. Uh, depressions of the mind is uh, what Jefferson would call them. It, you know, he suffered with these moments, these, these melancholy moments. And, but yet Jefferson looked at him in a whole different way. Even though Jefferson knew all that stuff about him, I love how he describes Meriwether Lewis. He calls him, quote, of courage undaunted. Meriwether Lewis is courage undaunted, possessing a firmness and a perseverance of purpose, careful as a father of those committed to his charge, yet steady in the maintenance of order and discipline, intimate with Indian character, customs, and principles, habituated to the hunting life, guarded by exact observation of vegetables and animals, honest, disinterested, liberal, of sound understanding, and a fidelity to the truth. He says, I could have no hesitation in confiding him to this enterprise. And that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to confide him to the enterprise. And on uh, February 23rd of 1801, he's going to make Meriwether Lewis, this is two years before the core discovery even starts to get in motion and get out the door. Two years earlier, he's going to make him his secretary. Uh, Meriwether Lewis is, is a bachelor. By this time, Thomas Jefferson himself is a bachelor. So you can imagine the White House. Uh, it was basically a bachelor pad for these two guys. And Meriwether Lewis moved in, and they lived in the White House together. And uh, they they enjoyed life together. They had a lot of parties there. Uh, it was it was quite the quite the time. Uh, Meriwether Lewis became very well connected in D.C. He had this this moment was so critical for him because he he made. He started to network. He started to learn uh, and understand the political forces necessary to to make things happen. And it's it's interesting that as he um, as he goes on, you know, Jefferson is kind of feeding him with information. He's showing him what's he's showing him. I think some of these books that he had in his library about the West. Uh, it's said that Jefferson had one of the had not just one of it was the largest library of books about the West. In fact, his library rivaled all the other libraries in the world when it came to knowledge about the Western United States. So I, I you know, I think that uh, Jefferson was uh, kind of feeding uh, Lewis some of those late night bowl sessions, some of those conversations around dinner. He, well, eventually Lewis caught the caught the bug. He he, he caught the idea. Um, now Jefferson is going to tell um, Lewis when they get closer that there are certain things he wants them to do. Jefferson wants to know. Jefferson is a man of the Enlightenment. He wants to know stuff. He wants to understand what's going on, and he wants to learn everything he can about the West. I mean, he he he's heard there's mammoths out there. There's still woolly mammoths that run around out there. He's heard all sorts of different stories about the Indians out there. Uh, he's he's heard about certain types of of animals and such, but he's never seen them. And he wants to know everything he can. He so, tells Meriwether Lewis, when it comes to journaling, I want you to keep copious notes. I want you to have several copies of those notes. Uh, you should be making copies in your leisure time and, and then putting them in the care, as he, as he says here in this particular quote, in the care of your most trustworthy of attendants. Guard them, you know, multiply them and guard them against any accidental losses. Because he knows, you know, if you just have one copy and the boat turns over and they all go downstream, we're sunk. We need to have every bit of information. That means we have to have multiple copies going. This is the amazing part about this journey. These guys were writers. They were biographers. They were scientists. Lewis, all the way up the river, is, he doesn't do much journaling at all. When you look at the journals that first summer, he's not doing hardly any journaling. He's doing scientific stuff. When he when he puts something out in the journal, it's, it's a bunch of uh, numbers and equations and such as he's hel helping to, he's the little scientist on board. It's Clark who's more the biographer. He's more the recorder. And these other guys that tell the stories as well. But he's saying in the loss of yourselves, we, you know, we, we may lose you, but we don't want to lose the information. He wants them to communicate often and as regularly as possible. So those are the expectations just about uh, the, the journey as it goes. Now, when it comes to Lewis, he's also got some other tasks that he has to do. In fact, in 1803, uh, it, it came very clear when, when Congress said, sure, let's, let's sign this thing off. Let's get this thing going. 
And the French were actually, just to kind of back up there and talk about the Louisiana Purchase for a moment, the French were involved in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Napoleon was was uh, basically overextended himself and got himself into some financial issues where he needed to liquidate, if you will. And that's how we got this piece of property so cheap, uh, $15 million. And it was uh, it was quite the land deal. It's probably the, it is the greatest land deal in all history. Uh, but in uh, many ways, he gave away the bank on this one because as, um, as we're going to learn, this is going to be rich, rich land. It's going to be land that has a lot of resources. And uh, this is something that's going to excite uh, Lewis and Clark, but it's also going to be something that's going to energize Western expansion in the uh, decades to come are these resources that are out here in the West. But um, Meriwether Lewis, again, was a captain. He was a military man. And, you know, he he was given this budget and it was not a very good budget when you think about it. But first thing he did was he went down to Harper's Ferry in March of 1803, and he literally ordered the best weapons that he could possibly get his hands on. Uh, they had just opened a new government armory down there in West Virginia, and he wanted to have the best weapons he could possibly get. And he got down there and ordered them. Uh, particularly, he wanted to order a, uh, some cannons, yes. and he did it very well, uh, putting together a, a cache of weapons that rivaled um, you know, any army <laughs> at that time. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it was often said that uh, there were many of the Indians uh, saw the firepower. I know the Teton Sioux mentioned this as well. They saw the firepower. The Nez Perce saw the firepower of, uh, of the armory that they were carrying uh, over uh, with them. And it was impressive enough that they, um, that they, <laughs> they wanted it. But uh, Meriwether Lewis is uh, going to go there. And then he's going to move up to Philadelphia. He's going to spend some time, May and June of 1803, he's going to spend it in Philadelphia. He's going to meet with a society known as the American Philosophical Society. It's basically a brain trust of some highly influential figures. There are several that he learns from. Uh, he, he learns from about botany. He learns about how to uh, navigate the stars, navigate by the stars, you know, field medicine. He's going to learn about that. He's going to learn about minerals and such. So he's going to get basically a crash course. Uh, one of the more significant individuals he's going to run into there in Philadelphia is Dr. Benjamin Rush. Uh, we often don't know that much about Dr. Benjamin Rush today, but at that time, Dr. Benjamin Rush was the number one medical doctor in the United States. And Benjamin Rush was probably one of the most intelligent men we ever had. Uh, a lot of people, when we talk about founding fathers, we mentioned Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, and certainly Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin are individuals who rise up. Uh, they were both members of this uh, American Philosophical Society. Uh, they both they, they definitely rise up as being intellectuals, but Benjamin Rush is right up there with them, and Benjamin Rush is going to teach Lewis a lot of field medicine. Now, Lewis already had some medical and medicine background. His mother was into natural medicine, uh, you know, using herbs and plants to heal and, and such. And so she was into that and she taught Lewis a lot of that. And Lewis is going to use a lot of that on the field as well. But um, Rush taught him a lot more about field medicine, about how the body works. And, you know, he gave him a list of things that you should do and some things you shouldn't do. In fact, one of the things Benjamin Rush says you shouldn't be doing is drinking. You guys don't drink on this. Now, part of that is because uh, Benjamin Rush was a very righteous person. <laughs> uh, he was uh, he was well known for his Christianity, and uh, he was a teetotaler. And, I, you know, I think Lewis, who was a young man at the time and was, uh, remember, he was in the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, which often gave them liberal opportunity to imbibe. Uh, Lewis was not of the mindset, especially with soldiers, of keeping them from their liquor. Uh, in fact, they're going to have a, a lot of a lot of liquor on this particular uh, journey. Uh, it's not going to last them for very long, but they're going to have it. And uh, he knows that when it comes to uh, young men, soldiers in particular, they like three things. They like their liquor, they like their smoke, and they like their women. And uh, the Explorer <laughs> Discovery is going to have fun with all of those uh, before it's said and done. And there are going to be a few that are going to get in trouble with that liquor. Um, but uh, anyway, that was one of the things that um, 
Benjamin Rush said, stay away, stay away from that. You know, that's, that's only going to get you in trouble. And in some ways, Benjamin Rush was right on that particular point. Uh, the other thing that Benjamin Rush uh, gave to uh, Meriwether Lewis was this um, uh, Thunderbolt pill. Uh, it, was, um, it was a unique uh, pill uh, that was basically a diuretic. And um, I, it was very powerful. Let's just put it that way. Uh, when you took it, it flushed you out something fierce. Uh, you can imagine these men, uh, you know, when eating eating one of these things, getting a little constipated and taking one of these things, and you know, it wasn't long before things were flowing. You might you might think or might add, but um, you know, they're going to eat nine pounds of meat a day, all right, or you know, when they when they can eat nine pounds of meat, they'll, they'll eat nine pounds of meat a day. When you look at the the meat that they're bringing in, especially out there in the Great Plains, they're shooting buffalo every day. They're shooting elk. They're shooting a lot of big game, a lot of deer. They're shooting and they're cooking up these venison steaks and elk, elk riblets and everything else. And uh, uh, so they're eating a lot of meat and that's protein and protein bottles you up pretty good. So you can imagine how these Thunderbolt pills would be very helpful. Good. Now, at that point, uh, after spending a couple months in Philadelphia, he heads back down to Washington, D.C. and basically waits. Now is a waiting game. And it's not too long. In fact, it's really the next couple of days after he gets back to Washington, D.C. They sits down and writes a letter. I, I think Lewis recognizes at this point that he's going to need help. Uh, maybe. I, I, I like to think he's in tune with those uh, dispositions of the mind, you might say, those, those that melancholy. I think he knows he kind of can get the blues from time to time, and he needs someone that's going to be a steady eddy type. He needs someone who's going to be able to walk along with him and um, you know, kind of call him on things and and remind him of why they're doing what they're doing. And when he gets a little blue, that that he needs a little sunshine blown into his life. And I think that's where Clark is going to come in, William Clark. And Meriwether Lewis is going to write a letter to William Clark on June nineteenth of eighteen o three, and he says, "Quote: Thus, my friend, you have a summary view of the plan." He's just told him exactly what they're going to do. This is the big picture of it. Thus, you have a view of the plan. Uh, the means and the objects of the expedition. If therefore there is anything under those circumstances in this enterprise, which would induce you to participate with me in its fatigues, its dangers, its honors, believe me, there's no man on earth with whom I should feel equal pleasure in sharing them as yourself. The other thing he says to Clark is, if you're going to do this with me, I'd like you to start recruiting. Uh, you know, I'm having some uh, issues recruiting. He was already trying to recruit. Lewis was. But uh, we need to find and engage some good hunters. We're looking for stout, healthy, unmarried men accustomed to the woods, capable of bearing uh, bodily fatigue in a pretty considerable degree. Now, in a nutshell, what's going on here is um, he's saying to Clark, listen, we need young muscle <laughs> we need some young men uh that, that can hunt and out there where clark's at that's the frontier you know uh, people that were accustomed to the woods people that could navigate you know that's the type of men they needed but notice he also said we want unmarried men and i i think what he's kind of doing there is he's saying listen we need men who are not attached uh, we we you know the men that you have out there are not mama boys you know, they, they've even cut the cord with mama and we really don't need any married men either because we don't want these guys getting out there in the middle of nowhere, wishing and crying and whining because they miss their, their wife. Um, plus we need to realize that this is potentially a dangerous expedition. We may not come back. We may get to a certain point and not come back and we don't want to you know obviously we can't do anything about mom or dad they're you know that's a, it's they need to recognize that this is going to be a dangerous mission in that regard but you know wives are different and kids are different and so um you know I, he was looking for someone who could you know again they're looking for young muscle but they also wanted unattached people people that were kind of on their own already uh, it's interesting he's also going to write a letter to his mother on july 2nd uh, of 1803. And he says to his mom, exactly what I just told you. He said, quote, the nature of this expedition is by no means dangerous. The charge of this expedition is honorable to myself as it is important to my country. I go with the most perfect pre-conviction in my own mind of returning safe. So he says, I'm going to come back, mom, mom, I'm coming back. 
I think I'm going to return safe and hope therefore that you will not suffer yourself to indulge any anxiety in my safety. So, so don't be, don't be worried about me, mom. I'm, I'm going to come back. You know, now that was um, hopefulness. And I love that. There's some hopefulness in that particular uh, thought. Then on July 4th, 1803, came news that dramatically expanded the expedition's importance. Napoleon Bonaparte, the emperor of France, had offered to sell the Louisiana Territory, the vast area between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains, to the United States for $15 million. It was a sum nearly twice the federal budget, but Jefferson never hesitated. For just three cents an acre, he more than doubled the size of his country. It was the greatest land deal in history. Jefferson had a mind that encompassed the continent. And he envisioned the creation of a great nation that would stretch from sea to sea, that would be bound together by a political concept, the idea of liberty. And he wanted to spread that liberty all the way out to the West Coast. At least on paper, nearly half of the West now belonged to the United States. But it was still a contested area. Spain controlled Texas, California, and all of the Southwest. England had Canada and a claim on the Oregon country. And in the fall of 1803, as Meriwether Lewis and his friend William Clark made their way to the eastern side of the Mississippi, no one knew for sure what Thomas Jefferson had just bought. Now, what happened on um, July 4th of that year, the Louisiana Purchase was in America's hands. And that, that Louisiana Territory, as it was called back then, was American soil now. France doesn't own this anymore. The flags that you see flying, those Spanish flags, you got to bring those down too. You got to bring the French flags down. Uh, it was to let all those French traders that were going up and down the Missouri, let them know that, hey, listen, uh, you, you guys, you're welcome to stay here and trade, but right now you need to know this is no longer France. France no longer owns this. Meriwether Lewis, once that all, once it's a go, it's a go. I mean, he literally leaves town practically the next day. Uh, and he heads off. He gets back to Harper's Ferry on July 8th to pick up the cannon and pick up the other uh, materials from the armory and get the cache of, 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 of equipment and, and such. And then he heads directly to Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, he's going to spend the rest of the summer, really, uh, till the end of August. He's going to spend the next six weeks getting a keelboat built. Now, really, it's not a keelboat. It's a keeled boat. And there's a, there's a fine distinction between that. The way to look at this particular boat that he wants built is it's a barge. But he wants that thing built, and he wants the best it can be. This is, this is government-issued property. So he has to find somebody who will build him that boat. And that's part of the problem. Uh, the guy that he finds basically is a drunk. <laughs> And the, uh, he um, he doesn't do very good at it. In fact, it takes about six weeks again for him to get it done. He keeps putting off the deadlines. Uh, you see it in the letters he was writing because he was writing letters back to Jefferson and even had some letters to, to Clark at one point about this where, hey, listen, we're supposed to take off the deadline. He says he's going to deliver next week and I should be on my way down there to Louisville where I'm going to meet with you, uh, Clark. And of course, it was pushed back and pushed back and, and such. So it took a while. But the other thing that's interesting is there's a local inventor there by the name of Isaiah Lukens, and he's going to supply, supply Lewis with a compressed air cannon. Um, it makes a loud boom. Let's just put it that way. It's louder than the actual cannons that fire the balls. Uh, this air cannon is loud. It was so impressive that they, this is the thing they showed off to the Indians. Whenever they met the, and had their council with the Indians, uh, they'd have these um, you know, kind of protocol, but they'd always take them back to the boat. They'd take these chiefs back to the boat to show off the barge, show off all the technology that they had. But the one thing they do is they fire off that air cannon. And the chiefs were like, 
giddy with excitement. They love to listen to that cannon and watch that cannon uh, go. And there's there's a lot of interesting stories around that cannon being shot. Uh, but don't confuse that cannon, the air cannon that they took, with the other three cannons. They had a, a cannon on the front of the keelboat, which was a swivel cannon that went around. And then they had two others more towards the back. And these were smaller cannons. So uh, they were they were running with some pretty good uh, artillery on that uh, keel boat as well, and that barge. I like to just call it a barge personally because I think it was more of a barge in the end because uh, it, it's kept all their supplies and 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 such. Uh, let's talk about William Clark for just a moment. Before we... He was born on August first of seventeen seventy in Charlottesville, Virginia. So keep in mind that both Lewis and Clark are Virginians by birth. Uh, he's six foot tall at this point. He's red haired. He's a popular leader. Clark is well known for his leadership skills. In fact, it's interesting. Uh, he's basically going to be in charge of the men. Uh, you, you, you see um, Lewis, I, I, I'm particularly impressed with that first summer. Uh, you see Lewis basically being the little scientist. He, uh, sometimes he never leaves the boat. I, I, I think he stays right on that boat. Clark often walks the um, walks the shoreline and Lewis is going to do more and more of that as they go. But at least initially he stayed on that boat. Uh, but it's Clark that's going to deal with the men all the way along. He's going to deal with the men over and over again. It's uh, Clark who's going to spend the winter at uh, Camp uh, Dubois or Wood River Camp there in St. Louis. And he's going to stay out there in the woods while Lewis stays in a nice cushy place back in St. Louis. You know, so he, he's staying with the men. Uh, he was home educated, but th that kind of made him a bit self-conscious. Um, and he, he shouldn't have been, I mean, to be honest, he shouldn't have been, but, but he, it wasn't his home education that made him, uh, self-conscious. It was his spelling. And back then there was really no clear, uh, grammar guide, uh, for spelling. It was kind of all over the map and, uh, they, they really, they really emphasize just write what it sounds like. Now, Lewis was much better as a speller, and I think that was because of his work as a secretary. Remember, he worked as a secretary for three years under Jefferson, and I think Jefferson demanded good spelling be part of the correspondence. Well, if he didn't so know how to spell before he got to Jefferson and his secretarial post, he certainly learned in the process and was very good. Uh, we see very few spelling issues with Lewis, but with Clark, uh, he is a horrific speller. Uh, he is literally all over the map with some of his words. His journals can be very interesting to read. He's the main biographer, the main journaler. So uh, you get a lot of information from Clark and a lot of it is you, you just have to read it by sounding it out. And that's what, that's how you understand it. Now he's going to move from Virginia to Kentucky in 1785. So he's 15 years old when he moves to Kentucky. This is the far reaches of the, uh, of the Western frontier at that point. He's going to serve in a, in the Northwest Indian war as a Lieutenant. And then he's going to resign. Literally at the top of his military career, he's going to resign. He's going to walk away from it. Uh, poor health is is the is the issue, and um, he's going to head back to his home in Kentucky and basically just live there and plant and you know enjoy the sunsets and such. And uh, I think he gets a little restless after a few years, and then uh, he gets the letter from Lewis. By the way, they did work together. Uh, Lewis was under Captain Clark at one point, and uh, they served together. So Lewis knew William Clark. William Clark's just a few years older than Lewis, and he he knew him, and he wanted him. And Clark so, right away fires a letter back off, and this is what Clark says. Uh, he says, I will cheerfully join you <laughs> and partake of the dangers, difficulties, and fatigues, and I anticipate the honors and rewards of the result of such an enterprise. This is an undertaking freighted with many difficulties, but my friend, I do assure you that no man lives with whom I would prefer to undertake such a trip as yourself. So it's like a mutual um, admiration society going on here. Clark wants to work with Lewis. Lewis wants to work with Clark. And in fact, they become the perfect dynamic duo. They are perfect for one another on this trip. Uh, their personalities are matched perfectly. Uh, their, their passions are matched. Uh, Clark, again, is the, the extroverted leader, where Lewis is more the introverted uh, scientist. And uh, it's, it just works really, really well. We know that uh, on August 31st, basically, Lewis leaves Pittsburgh. He's got 11 men with him, seven of which are soldiers. 
and they have a pilot and three young men on trial. Uh, they're going to see whether or not these guys can actually do what they say they can do. And they're going to head down the Ohio River. And uh, one of their first big stops is going to be, of course, Cincinnati. Uh, they're going to stay there for a few days and check some things out, including a, a, a dinosaur fossil. It was a fossilized uh, elephant. But anyway, they're going to travel down the Ohio River and uh, have a, uh, you know, to, to get to the Mississippi. But again, they arrive in uh, Cincinnati, and the uh, first thing they do is resupply. They're going to spend about a week there, as I recall. And again, Lewis is going to do some exploration of the area. He's going. This is really the time when Lewis is writing the most. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the journals, in in this in 1803, when he leaves um, Pittsburgh, Lewis is pretty much journaling almost every day. Now there are a couple times where he stops journaling for a week or so. But he probably, he gives us some really good information. I kind of wish Lewis would have kept that up all the way through. But it definitely on this leg of the journey, there's no William Clark yet. Uh, so Lewis is the one that has to document everything going on. And maybe that's what happens with the journaling. And maybe Lewis just says, I'm, I'm a scientist. I like to do the numbers. I like running the numbers. And, and Clark says, listen, buddy, just you go ahead and do that. I will make sure that we wrap all this stuff up nice and tidy. I'll make sure the narrative's there. I'll make sure the story gets done. So maybe that was part of that give and take. We, we don't know. Um, all I know is that when you look at Jefferson's admonitions, he says, I want both my captains writing. I want all the sergeants writing and any of the men that will write. I want to have as many journals as possible. And somewhere along the way, there's a disconnect, at least for Lewis. Uh, there, there are some people that, that suggest that, that this was evidence of his melancholy, that in those times when he didn't write, that he was maybe depressed. I, I think that's a hard one to prove, to be honest. Uh, you know, as I read the journals, I I don't sense that's the reason he's not writing. I I sense it's more that he's involved with doing scientific and navigation, and he's doing all sorts of other things. And um, Clark is the one that that really fills in those gaps, and I think they just work well together. But uh, I could be wrong on that. Um, I'm certainly open minded, and there are definitely times where Lewis does convey that he's. He's struggling with his self-image and his purpose in life. But they're going to reach um, Clarksville, Indiana, which is right across from uh, Louisville on October 15th of 1803. And that's where Clark's going to pick up with, um, with Lewis. And he's also going to bring on some young men with him, several young men uh, that are going to make this journey as well, including, uh, well, they already had a guy by the name of John Coulter. We're going to talk about John Coulter later, but you know, this is where they kind of pick up Patrick Gass and some of these other guys here along the way. And uh, it's, um, it's, they're, they're, they're doing well. Let's just say at this point there, Clark did his job, right? He, he brought on some, some good solid help, but all the way along the way, you know, they're meeting people, you know, whenever they, they stop for the night they're meeting people and they're 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 having conversations and there's young men out there who say look i'll go with you i'll go with you well okay well this is a military operation are you are you prepared to work as a private here because we these are privates we want and we're gonna need some sergeants as well but we got we got your this is military are you willing to do that and uh that is um that 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 communicates well and they do pick up others as they as they come along uh, they're going to leave Louisville October 26, 1803, and then they're going to reach the Mississippi River around November. So about a month later, they're going to they're going to reach uh, the Mississippi, and um, this is where when you start looking at how far they're going, and and Clark really is the one that later, and in fact, I love it in the journals. He actually navigates and tells you how many miles they travel each and every day. Uh, that's a wonderful gift he gives to us, so we can kind of know that they're averaging about nine miles a day. And let me tell you, they realize that's too slow. It's too slow. They can't, they got to pick up the pace. It's not fast enough. And that means they're going to have to have more muscle, especially when they turn the corner. See, as they went down the Ohio river, it's going downstream and they had all sorts of problems. You got to realize late in the season, they're, they're running in the fall of the year primarily. And uh, you know, the, the, the flow is low on that Ohio river. And it's going to be low on the Missouri as well. They're going to find that out the next summer. There's going to be sandbars and there's going to be logs and there's going to be all sorts of obstacles that are going to slow them down. And they're going to need a lot of muscle. And that's what's going to happen here this first winter. They're going to stop 
and they're going to basically re do a lot of stuff. They're going to fix a lot of things. They're going to rethink a lot of their, their ideas of how they're approaching this. The one thing that they both come to the conclusion, both Clark and, and Lewis come to the conclusion on is that, Hey, we have got to pick up the pace. Nine miles a day is not going to be enough. We need to double that, which means they're going to have to have more men. And by this point, you know, they just got a couple dozen men. They're going to need to double that heading out and they're going to winter camp at a place, uh, uh, across from St. Louis, just a little bit north of St. Louis. It's uh, called the Wood River Camp. It's also known as Camp Dubois. Dubois means wood or tree, so Camp Tree, Camp Wood. Uh, but it, it's on the Wood River there, and they're going to winter there in 1803 to 1804, and they're not going to leave until May, uh, but they're going to hunker down there and uh, spend the winter there, and it's it's going to be a it's going to be a cold winter, but it's not going to be anything like what they're going to experience the next two winters, particularly in North Dakota. Uh, that's going to be brutally cold. But when they get to the Wood River Camp, one of the things that they have to do is they start, have to start figuring out where they're going to put the guys. You know, everybody's got their roles and responsibilities. And so they've got to find out who the best hunters are. And I think that first winter was all about sending the men out, figuring out who could hunt. Ordway and Drouillard, those guys, Drouillard in particular, he was a front, one of their French interpreters. He was really good uh, hunter. So John Coulter proved to be a crack shot hunter. And so those hunters were kind of identified because as they're going upstream, they're going to send out these hunters to go get the meat. Uh, go get supper for us. They're going to need gunsmiths because they're they're shooting off all of these guns at at animals and bringing in all this game. They're going to need a gunsmith to repair the guns and keep them in good shape. They're going to need somebody to cook, uh, and certainly uh, they're going to find different cooks along the way. Every they're going to break into four or five, excuse me, four messes eventually, and each one of these messes are going to have a have a cook assigned to them. So they're going to need some cooks along the way. They're going to need rivermen. There are certain men that kind of they, they find have good uh, river experience. And so they're going to identify those. Uh, they're going to need some carpenters. Patrick Gass, uh, he was their carpenter. He he helped build the fort. He actually helped construct and, and give some ideas on how to build those forts uh, at Mandan, as well as at Fort Clatsop up there in uh, western Oregon. Uh, they're going to need interpreters. Uh, they're going to bring a lot of French interpreters along. Um, because the, the French at that time were the ones that were working the river and they were the ones talking to the Indians. And so there were French interpreters that could speak certain dialects of the Indians. They could speak Oto or they could speak Teton or they could speak Arikara, you know. Um, but as they go north, they're going to have to find more and more interpreters. In fact, at the Mandan villages uh, the next winter, they're going to have to find some interpreters that are going to be able to interpret, you know, help us understand the Shoshone language. They're looking for these men. These are the necessary men. The other thing to keep in mind is they had to have some sergeants and they're going to basically break into three areas, three sergeants. Uh, there's going to be Charles Floyd's going to be a sergeant. John Ordway is going to be a sergeant. And of course, Nathaniel Pryor are going to be sergeants. And these three men initially are the cream of the crop. They are the best that they've got. And they, they are individuals that uh, they're not in trouble. They're military men. A lot of them have already had military experience. In fact, I think they all had military experience. These guys, uh, they, they were ready to go. Uh, they knew how to work with men. They knew how to to get them to get them in, in order. Now, the thing to keep in mind here about Camp Wood River or Dubois is that it was um, it really tested the men and their discipline. And it doesn't take long. I, I find reading the journals during this particular period fascinating. Uh, it's almost like a frat party experience going on that first winter in St. Louis. Uh, they're they're breaking into the liquor. Uh, they're, they're going out there. They, they found out very quickly that there are local suppliers who will, you know, if they can't get their, 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 they had an allotment of liquor every single night, a little shot glass, if you will, of liquor as part of their ration. Uh, but, uh, they quickly found out they could go down to the local merchants around the area. And uh, it was, um, it was an interesting winter. They got into a lot of trouble. These guys did, there was fighting amongst them. Uh, there were court marshals, uh, and it just was really, really hard. In, in fact, it, it spilled over into the following summers. We're going to talk about that in the next session. It spilled over because they had court marshals all the way up the Missouri River. And uh, it's, it, again, I think it's because of their youth. 
these guys were young guys. They were, these are guys in their twenties and uh, they, this is their first time really maybe out and about on a, on a great mission. And uh, the military aspect maybe gave them some, some bravado that, um, that they, um, that, that maybe kind of got them in more trouble than they should. Right. One last thing I want to talk about here before we close is the supplies that they needed. Um, when you look at the supplies, uh, they they had a they had a lot of different things they had to get together and realize this is a military mission and they have no idea how long it's going to take. And we're going to talk about some of the things that they do in order to make sure they can get back. And when you look at what's on their list, you know, weapons and ammunition, they are going to take two things on this trip that they're going to come back and still have a lot of. One is they're going to come back with a lot of ammunition. They have plenty of bullets. And secondly, they're going to come back with a lot of paper. Uh, they, they, they took a lot of paper and ink to do the journaling, but they're also going to take navigational tools. Uh, they're also going to take food and uh, they took soup and biscuits and salt, a lot of that. They had this portable soup and uh, they used that all the way up until into the late summer of, of 1805 as they crossed the, the Montana Bitterroots. They were, they were actually using that portable soup at that point, but tobacco and whiskey were also on board. As I mentioned, they had 18 kegs of whiskey. <laughs> so uh, they, they were ready to go when it comes to the whiskey, uh, but it was not near enough. They probably needed about three times that amount uh, because the whiskey's going to run out and uh, the ration's not there to be able to do it and, and such. But tents, clothing, utensils are also on board, fishing hooks. Hey, they know they're going to have to go fishing at times. They got soap. I think this was the mother I think there was a mom out there that said, you boys are going to take soap, okay? I mean, uh, they did have soap on board. How much they used it uh, remains to be seen. But we do know that soap was packed. Um, one of the things they're going to get in trouble with is with the mosquitoes. We'll talk about that later. But I think if they'd taken a few more baths along the way, they might, and, and smell better, it might have helped them out with some of those mosquitoes. But tools and fire starters were also on the barge. Medical supplies. Again, they took a lot of medical supplies. And then trading wares. They knew that they're going to engage these the, the Indians and, and the natives, uh, Native Americans along the way, these indigenous peoples. And they wanted to be able to... Uh, to trade with them. And, and they had everything from little mirrors to, to beads to, you know, uh, little knives and all sorts of different things that they traded and among other, other items that they traded with the, uh, with the Indians along the way as, as they went. Here's what's interesting. The total weight of the barge and the parochs, the canoes, they had two parochs. They had the barge and they had two parochs. Now, parochs is just a fancy word for a canoe. It, it was, you know, we can call them canoes today, but probably, they called them a parochs back then. But they had two parochs. They had a red parochs and a white parochs, and sometimes that's important in distinction. The red parochs was always, always having problems. The red parochs, even before they got to St. Louis, was leaking. They tried to get rid of it at one point because it just, it just was leaking too much, but they needed it too much. Uh, but uh, they were constantly patching that to keep it from leaking. And it leaked all the way up. Uh, but they they packed uh, 21 bales, two boxes, and three boats. And the total weight was more than 10 tons. Now, that is interesting. Because remember, th this would explain why they're only making nine miles a day. You're pushing 10 tons of equipment up the river. And they're going to find out very quickly that this is going to be a difficult, hard, long, exhausting trip. Jefferson wanted them to do essentially four things. First of all, to assess the potential trade route across the continent. Is there something there that we can use? Is there something there that will be useful for all nations in trading? Secondly, meet with the Native peoples to establish peace. Peace with with uh, the white, but also peace with each other. Indians were very open to this idea. Yeah, we want peace. We need peace. Peace is good. The third thing was gather scientific information on geography, animals, and plants. And they're going to do that. They're going to have a lot of stuff they bring back. They're going to, there's going to be over 300 new discoveries uh, that they're going to bring back animals and plants that uh, that have never been seen before. Uh, they're going to take some of these uh, animals and they're going to 
you know, they're going to bring them back. In some cases, they're going to bring back live animals. And then finally, to document all that they saw. I can't underscore this. This is what makes the Lewis and Clark expedition so fascinating for historians is that we have the it's not just one guy writing this narrative it's just not one person writing a report you've got multiple guys and they all write differently you know when patrick gas starts writing about things he likes to write ah this was handsome and that was handsome and basically handsome was another word for beautiful he's writing all these great uh, you know he sees a mountain he calls it handsome and he sees a river and he calls it handsome you know you, he's a I, gas is kind of a gas <laughs> you know he's a romantic when it comes to uh to the to the river and to this journey and then you got uh clark who is just straightforward he's a military guy it's about uh it's about reporting you know write what's necessary and i like that that's important as well uh, but you have white house and you have ordway is also uh chipping in there with some of their information and and uh they all help us confirm you know, what I love about more than anything is I read the journals and I want to encourage you to go to my website, rickcromie.com. If you go under American Cruise Lines, uh, you will find that there are tabs there that will take you where you can read. I've created a summary of every single day and I've done that because the journals are so helpful. So if you want to find out what happened on every day along the way, you can do that at my website. Again, rickcromie.com. Okay, well, that's the end of session one. Uh, glad you joined me on this particular part of the journey, and I look forward to uh, taking you upriver. <laughs>